Well, um, very good introduction, thank you. <laughs> the, <clears throat> the topic here is not an obviously connected one. So often when I talk about this, people think, why has he got a little playground there? And that doesn't fit with my understanding of what genocide is. Um, and part of what we do at the School of Advanced Study, where we teach human rights plus, okay, is to connect these, these dots. And in so doing, we've set up this Extreme Energy Initiative, okay, so it's extremeenergy.org, which looks at the social and environmental impacts of extreme energy, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, personally, I came to this field after studying Indigenous rights in Australia and being quite shocked with what I learned during my PhD years. I went to Australia, sort of on the usual British backpacking, bungee jumping nonsense. Uh, saw things there that horrified me, and then I became interested in human rights. And from that point on, when hearing about the, the child removal policies in Australia, I got dragged into this field of genocide studies. Um, and as grisly as it sounds, I actually found it quite empowering. There's elements in it which are not broadly understood, but which give us the conceptual tools and also the legal tools to think through things that are what we're going to talk about in a bit, okay, environmental destruction. So they're not obviously connected first off, but I'll try and join the dots. Okay, uh, next slide. Slide, sorry, I'm going to have to do a lot of slide changing because it's very picture heavy. It's usually not a problem with the, uh, the Welsh voice. But, uh, okay, so uh, this is a sort of story of the book, right? Uh, unlike a previous speaker, there was only one book. And it may not be the best £10 you've ever spent if you do buy it. Okay, um, so it's connecting these elements together. Um, I became interested in ecocide and the campaign about that, which I'll talk about later, through the lens of genocide studies, right? So what really connects all of these things together? Okay, next slide. Possibly I'll just say next or slide. There you go. Is this sort of thing. So I don't know if anyone's seen these pictures. They're quite popular in the sort of anti-fracking movement. Now, what they are are connected or clusters of fracking pads, right? So whilst an individual one might not take up much space, collectively, cumulatively, they have a very, very big footprint. And for indigenous peoples who use the land quite differently from this, this sort of stuff is extremely damaging. Uh, next slide. This is the sort of poster child of extreme energy. Okay, um, anyone, anyone heard of this? Okay, this is the Alberta tar sands. And it's the poster child of extreme energy because it's so extreme, okay? Um, you can see it from space. There are a couple of films out on the web where you can really get a sense of the enormity of the destruction involved in this sort of energy uh, extraction. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a few slides time, but that's sort of one of the key slides, I think, that can bring this genocide ecocide nexus together. And principally because of the impact it has on downstream indigenous communities uh, who are all suffering quite horrendously from this. Next slide. The sorts of um, illnesses that you've seen from people living downstream of this stuff are, are really quite horrendous. Um, there's been a number of, of reports where doctors have, have mentioned uh, rare instances of cancers they've not seen before. Okay? Um, that's just one element, but obviously you can see the actual destruction on the surface level. That used to be boreal forest, by the way, okay? so it's now just that wasteland. Um, so it's an incredible change. It's also a very, very worrying thing for everybody. Um, there's been some suggestion if all of the oil extracted from the tar sands were to be extracted, that alone would send us over into a tipping point. Um, it's that nasty and it's that inefficient. That's the other important thing. I'll come on to that in a bit. Okay, next slide. Some of the quotes from uh, research I did with a colleague and friend, Jen Huseman, um, that's also in the book. This is the sort of language indigenous peoples are using, and this is where you start to feel the connection between environmental destruction and genocide. If we don't have land and we don't have anywhere to carry out our traditional lifestyle, we lose who we are as a people. That's where you get the genocide, the genos bit, okay? Distinct cultural groupings. So if there's no land, then there's, it's the equivalent in our estimation to a genocide of a people. Our message to both levels of government, to Albertas, Canadians and uh, the rest of the world who may depend on oil sands for their energy solutions is that we can no longer be sacrificed. That's where we come into it, okay? okay? The, the global demand for energy too. Um, and these two quotes are just two I could have picked out of a number. 
So this is one of the elements that I find really interesting about genocide studies because those scholars and the popular understandings of genocide are simply about mass killing look at this as exaggeration. And the same arguments I saw in Australia when I was doing my field work over there, it was described as, oh, well, that's just indigenous people being overly emotional about you know, the onset of Western civilization, etc. So in studying genocide studies, I realized actually their understanding of genocide is much more accurate than popular understandings. OK, next slide. This is the UN Convention, and it's actually part of the problem. You don't get me saying that very often, being a human rights person, OK? But this UN definition is woefully inadequate on a number of levels and doesn't reflect the ideas of the person who made up the word genocide. So this is um, the legal definition. You can see straight away the first thing, killing members of the group. So if there's no direct killing. Popular understandings now suggest that, oh, actually, well, it's not really genocide. You're, you're exaggerating. Uh, next slide. To get clarity on this, you have to go back to the guy who invented the term. And he invented it for a number of important reasons, primarily because he was interested in protecting national minorities. He was very interested in the power of naming and particularly uh, shocked to discover the Armenian slaughter okay, in, <coughs> in the past. So it was 1933 where he came up with this idea that what we needed in international law was to ban two things, to criminalise two elements. Barbarity, he called it, and vandalism. So barbarity was the, the killing dimension and vandalism was the cultural dimension which has been largely ignored in this discussion. He was also very interested in the effects of occupation policies. And his, his, his landmark book was Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, in which the chapter on genocide uh, was contained. But it's a book about the effects of occupation policies. And actually, in many ways, about colonization. Uh, next slide. So this was what he thought genocide was, OK? These two broad methods. Killing individual members, physical genocide, and the second one, undermining its way of life, cultural genocide. And the important thing for Lemkin was that they, they were not uh, differing in moral uh, weight, okay? Uh, they were just different methods to achieve the same outcome. So cultural genocide was not a lesser form of it. It was simply a different method to achieve the same result. Genocide, he says, has two phases. Sorry, back to there. The destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group. The other, the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. This imposition, in turn, may be made upon the oppressed uh, population, which is allowed to remain, or upon the territory alone after the removal of the population. So this is the colonization bit, the supplanting of one group by another. And that's often downplayed or ignored within the field of genocide studies, as is the cultural dimension. Very, very different understanding to the UN Convention. And that's because... The UN Convention was a political beast. It was made through a whole process of UN political discussions where um, interests competed and fought over different technical definitions, etc. That's basically why uh, the cultural dimension was largely removed from the Convention. People, states were worried about being called to account for cultural destruction. Next slide. But why was he interested in culture? Well, for, for Lemkin, it was culture that held together national minorities and groups like indigenous peoples. The world, he said, represents only so much culture and intellectual vigour as are created by its component national groups. The destruction of a nation, therefore, results in the loss of its future contributions to the world. It's that future contributions to the world that he's really interested in. OK? <laughs> <laughs> So he puts that on a par, right, with physical killing. That's the important thing. OK, next slide. So cultural genocide, said Lemkin, is the most important part of the convention. But he reluctantly approved its omission uh, for political reasons. He says, I defended it successfully through two drafts. It meant the destruction of the cultural pattern of a group, such as the language, traditions, the monuments, archives, libraries, churches, in brief, the shrines of the soul of a nation but there was not enough support for the idea in the committee, so with a heavy heart, I decided not to press for it. In his own words, Lemkin had to drop an idea that was very dear to me. No wonder it was dear to him, because it was the central aspect of what animates a genos in genocide. Without cultural 
difference. Without cultural significance, there is no genos. Hence, we should be choosing a different concept, like mass murder or something. Um, so those who focus heavily on mass killing are completely missing the point of genocide. If you look at the, um, the background writing that Lemkin did, the unpublished work, etc., there's this very, very strong sense of cultural importance and colonisation. Uh, next slide. As my friend uh, Dirk Moses says, um, those who seek different ways of understanding genocide um, suggest that Lemkin did not properly understand genocide, despite the fact that he invented the term and went for great trouble to explain its meaning. Instead, most scholars presume to instruct Lemkin retrospectively about his concept, although they are in fact proposing a different one, usually mass murder. So there's a very problematic popular understanding of genocide that's linked purely with physical killing. Okay, next slide. So when it comes to like indigenous peoples and those who live in places like the tar sands or where there's coal seam gas developments, they are simply in the way. Okay, uh, this is a well put point. Land is life, or at least land is necessary for life, and contests for land can be often indeed are contests for life. As Deborah Bird Rose says, to get in the way of settler colonization, all the native has to do is stay at home. And then Norbert Finch put settler imperialism as inherently genocidal, and Lemkin thought that too. Okay, so colonisation, Lemkin saw as inherently genocidal. You cannot colonise without genocidal implications and genocidal effects. And then the supplanting of one group onto another. What you see in Australia is indigenous groups have very little say in resisting development, virtually none. All they have is a right to negotiate, they have no right to veto, hence they can't stop this stuff. Okay, next slide. So how do we link this um, to a bigger picture and our role in this element? Well, there's a number of important things we need to think about with this. Principally in the face of climate change, cultural erosion is very, very worrying because culture's been humanity's primary adaptive mechanism. Okay, in terms of changes to the climate. So if we're losing cultural distinctiveness and the future contributions to the world that Lemke was talking about, we're in danger of losing our ability to adapt through uh, a lack of traditional knowledge of um, certain environments. You've also got the role of energy demand here. And then the notion of peaking of conventional energy. There's lots of debates about whether energy's peaked and whether resources are running out, but not much distinction between conventional and unconventional resources. Okay, there's much more consensus on the notion that conventional resources have peaked. Conventional meaning the easier to get at stuff, the stuff that's actually reasonably efficient. And then we get to the rise of what we call extreme energy. So I'll explain what that is now. Next slide. Okay, take us back a step. If we look at where the demand comes from. Conventional fields are declining at a rate between 6 to 9% a year. We all know we live in a growth-driven Western capitalism, etc., which needs to grow. If we're declining in terms of the resources that that system depends on at 6 to 9% a year, you have to replace that, and then you've got to replace uh, more to get that growth, which is all resource-dependent. So, um, next slide. It's producing this drive towards unconventional, which the tar sands is the classic example. The difference between the two of them, say a conventional well will yield, say, one barrel of energy that goes into it, produced between 60 and 80 or 100 out. Really quite efficient. The tar sands is one barrel of energy in to one to three or six out. It's grossly inefficient in comparison. Um, <coughs> and fracking produces somewhere between one to eight or one to 50, but nowhere near one to 60, etc. So the efficiency level is going right down. Uh, next slide. Um, so extreme energy then is the process whereby energy extraction methods grow more intense over time as easier to extract resources are depleted. The process is driven by unsustainable energy consumption and it's important because extraction effort strongly correlates with damage to both society and the environment. The more effort that goes in, the more damaging it usually is. Understood, thus extreme energy is evident in the history of energy extraction. We always go for the easier stuff first. It's rational to do that. Okay, simpler and easier, etc. And then it gets more difficult and we get more risky extraction methods, ultimately. Uh, next slide. And then you get this issue too. So the more energy you use to get the stuff out, the less we get to use. So the next three you can do quickly. It'll look like a sort of cartoon. There you go. So finally at the end, you've got energy used in the process, very thick. 
and the energy society gets to use much, much lower, which also challenges any notion of being able to achieve the levels of growth that our governments tell us we need. Okay, this is one of the limits to growth. Okay, this energy extraction and the energy return on the energy invested uh, figure. Okay, next point. Another one after. There you go. Okay, so to get a, say, a scale of the, uh, an understanding of the scale of this stuff beyond the basic extraction, they all come with their infrastructure. This is a tar sands refinery. They're absolutely monstrous. Uh, next one. And as is their externalities, right? The waste that they produce. Um, and you get wonderful euphemisms by the industry. They're called tailings ponds. If anyone's seen one, they're much more like a lake. Uh, and this is all the waste because the method of extraction is about blasting oil off little bituminous sands, right? So you've got to get the oil off a piece of sand, grain of sand, uh, with high injection pressure water, and that produces all sorts of um, hideous uh, effluent filled lakes or ponds, as they call them, and birds land in them. It's, it you know, literally is a, a grim, grim process. Next slide. And you can see these vehicles here that are used in the extraction. They're so big that some of them require the truck driver to get a lift up to his cab. Um, they are monstrous, monstrous vehicles. Next one. And again, I mean, it's, they're, they're all, you should have a look at them. The films are incredible too. It is incredible, the scale and size of it. Okay, next slide. Okay, now fracking is somewhat different. Um, I'm not going to go into it in great detail here, but the things that really come out of the research that I do is that all of the debates about the technical dimensions are way less important to groups that live near it than on what goes on at the surface. Surprise, surprise, because that's where people live. Okay, so the footprint of the surface, the truck journeys, the amounts of water required, all of that and the traffic, all of that is what concerns people most. Ultimately, if the water gets polluted, of course that's concerning, but usually it comes from this well casing here breaking and the water being polluted at this point rather than this, which is where a lot of the debates about the pros and cons of it and the safety of it are focused. And actually, in many respects, uh, the risks are on surface level. Okay, next slide. So these are some um, pictures from um, the US and Australia about frac pads. Uh, and as I said, on the front of it, they look much less damaging than something like the tar sands, but you put them all together en masse. And in the UK, when they're talking about it, um, the levels of gas that they say we can get out would require a hell of a lot of this, not just one or two pads here or there. Okay, next one. So that's the one we saw earlier. Okay, that gives you a picture of what it's like when it's all clustered together. Next slide. And then we come to the connection with this notion of ecocide. So it's a very quick run through of the work I've been doing. It's a reasonably dense book. OK, but I came to this notion of ecocide for two main reasons. Firstly, it describes that method of environmental destruction and its relationship to, to genocide. The word ecocide first came out um, when a commission on minorities in the UN was looking at revising the Genocide Convention because it wasn't being used prior to Rwanda. And they wanted to bring in, reinstate the cultural method and bring in this in notion of ecocide. And it was because at the time, Agent Orange was being spread all over Vietnam, okay? And there was a sense that environmental destruction is a weapon of war, okay? So the UN became interested in it from that point of view. Uh, we did some research on the history of, UN, uh, of ecocide in the UN system. And again, through political shenanigans, it, it, led to its demise and it didn't really make it through but now there's a new movement to end ecocide on earth with um, an attempt to get uh, the Rome statute amended okay and it needs a state to sponsor that notion and we're getting reasonably close at the moment by targeting those states most vulnerable to climate change and that would make dangerous environmental damage criminal how likely is it to happen? I'm sort of less worried about that because the movement is achieving an awful lot of important things. Um, whether we get to the end goal or not is, is some, sort of a moot point in some respects because I think knowledge of environmental destruction is increasing because of this, uh, well, this movement among many other movements. Okay, next slide. Uh, Polly Higgins is one of the main advocates for this. Um, I wouldn't quite call her a modern day Lemkin yet but she may be, ultimately, if it gets through. That's her definition of, uh, of ecocide. Uh, 
simple way of thinking about it is destruction of ecosystems, okay, um, which happens a lot with corporate involvement. So you can imagine the lobbying that went on to reduce the genocide convention's potential. If this gets to the discussion table, the corporate lobbying will be monstrous. I can pretty much guarantee that. I mean, I've written all sorts of contentious issues and I've never had more negative pressure and feedback than when I wrote about the tar sands because there's big corporate involvement and big money in it. So I think that's the big challenge for getting ecocide on the criminal law statute books. Okay, next slide. Vandana Shiva is a big um, advocate of this. So have a look at it, endecocide.org. It's, it's got a network, um, join us, plea. Okay, I think it's a really, really worthwhile endeavour, even if it may not reach its ultimate goal. Okay, but they all have an appreciation of the interconnected nature of the things uh, that we've talked about so far. Uh, next slide. And then I'm particularly interested in what happens and concerned uh, about what happens when it comes to this spread of fracking. Because one of the things it's doing is it's taking a lot of energy out of the movement that's looking at climate change more generally because people are fighting fires in their local communities as more and more fracking applications um, begin. And it's not just fracking, it's the whole range of, of unconventional energy um, production. But principally, the thing that's worrying a lot of scholars now is this, the connection between multilateral corporations and domestic politics. Now, a wonderful um, consultant that I work with, Paul Mobbs, has done some wonderful research that's highlighted the connections between corporations, scholars as well, fracademics as they're called, okay, and governments. So this is a bit out of date now, the next picture, uh, but it gives you a flavour. The newest one is so monstrous I can't fit it onto one slide. So let's have a look at the coalition, as marvellous as they were, joke, okay. This was the coalition. Now one of the most concerning dimensions to this myriad of tentacles connecting these players together is this one. I think if this were another country context, it would be called what it is, and I think this is corruption here. Okay. If you look at the top, you had Lord Brown, who was the chairman of the main fracking firm in the UK at the time, Cordrilla, at the same time as being a lead non-executive director in the Cabinet Office. How on earth is that possible? Okay, advising on energy policy. Um, that's the sort of picture of the corporate network involved in this. Okay, next slide. In terms of the repercussions for climate change and everything else, we know that we already have more than enough conventional energy in the ground to fry us all. So going after unconventional energy is literally like sprinting in the wrong direction. And a lot of people know this, and that's why there's a lot of resistance to it. The downside is it takes you away from the global challenges too, because you're focused on local resistance. Climate scientists are pretty much unequivocal when it comes to unconventional energy. Just keep it in the ground along with the vast majority of the rest of the resources. That's the massive challenge. Okay, next slide. Um, however, there are real seeds of optimism. In one year, this is February 2013, you started to see the anti-fracking movement become the fastest growing social movement in the UK. Next slide. In one year, you saw that. Right, and the map is pretty much covered now. Okay, if you look on, on Frack Off, which is the main network, um, the anti-extreme energy network, you'll see that there are more and more and more and more and more local groups. Okay, next slide. And then ultimately, I think uh, this is the next thing I'm, I'm looking at now, uh, looking at the police involvement in actually not facilitating protest, but facilitating, facilitating energy extraction. Okay, they're acting now more and more like security guards for the companies, which is deeply, deeply worrying. Um, the latest research we're looking at is whether there are national strategies and national um, targets across all of the police forces that are looking at anti-fracking groups and targeting them and their behaviours and surveillance and monitoring and all the rest of it uh, to facilitate the fracking industry in the UK. And that's the latest deeply worrying element. But the positive side is this. Okay. The anti-fracking groups now are very, very vocal, um, very clued up. They read a lot of the latest research, and I see this as, as one of the more positive um, dimensions, actually. Uh, so I think that's the end of the million slides, so I'll probably stop there. Okay, cheers. Thanks.
questions? Okay. Okay. How did media plays impact in fracking, and where do you think? He talks about companies. The media is obviously mm. companies. Mm. Sky is kind of mm. What do you think? Um, oh, they're, they're very, very important, and um, you, unfortunately, usually in a negative way. There's not much that they say positive about the anti-fracking movement. Occasionally, you might get a few articles saying that, oh, we're surprised to see that it, the, the resistance to it isn't just a load of tree huggers, inverted commas. You know, there may be some, you know, affluent Tories that don't like it as well. And that's about the most incredulous sort of article you get. Very little that's positive. Social media is different, um, but the mainstream media is, is, is pretty poor on it. And, and when they try and present a, quote, balanced discussion. It's usually um, with a quote from people who are easily dismissed, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's bad, it's abysmal. Um, and I'm sure that they will feature in, a, in an expanded version of the political interests involved too. Um, but I think most people are looking to social media and, and the doc documentaries and films and things like that, and the stories from, from the countries that have experienced it, uh, which are largely all bad. Okay. <laughs> I've got a question. The guy at the top, the sort of bad guy, the sort of evil, <coughs> um, uh, presumably he may have, when he goes to bed and looks himself in the mirror, mm, mm. he may think, I'm doing a good thing. You know, <coughs> we need the energy. There's no, yeah. there's no, seem, there's no seemingly reduced um, need for the energy. Like, the people aren't changing <coughs> lifestyles, mm, not, mm, some are, but mm. not, not and so you say, I'm doing, you know, it may is a necessary evil to produce the energy that, that, that everyone actually wants. And I'm just sort of, ser I'm a servant. So, uh, on some way, you can imagine that kind of reasoning. Like, it's easy for us to say, like, bad, it's terrible, it's mm. like, it's obviously terrible, you just have to look at the pictures. But, like, isn't it, pointing the finger at him is, mm. it's just an easy way out, isn't it? I mean, surely it's about reducing the requirement for energy, yeah. which should be the main thing we should be talking about rather than needing to produce more. That's, that's, the, that's the educational thing that needs to happen. Right? I think you need both, actually. Uh, I think you do need to point the finger at them. Um, and I think you also do need to reduce the energy consumption. I know they could say they're providing a service, but the manner in which they do it yeah. is often very <laughs> reprehensible, to say the least. Um, you see them in negotiations with vulnerable groups. You know, they behave like ruthless, ruthless monsters, to be fair. So, I mean, I have sympathy with that argument. And I remember watching the Corporation film years ago, and I think it was the CEO of BP that had people saying, you know, had, they were trying to drop a flag on his, on his house saying he was a killer and stuff like this. And he came out and expressed all those arguments. And ended up, they ended up having tea on his lawn and stuff. And he was sort of half ridiculed in the film. But the point that they were making is that, you know, he still has responsibility. You know, I know they could uh, remove him, you know, but they said this about other totalitarian regimes, you know, with people who didn't want to press the button and refuse, then they get someone else to, to come in and do it. So, yeah, there is a big picture element, and the demand is very, very important, but they're also important in creating their demand too. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. You know, everything, the whole parcel of overconsumption is driven towards, you know, um, that unsustainable way of doing things, you know. So I think you need to look at everything, you know. It's a, but it's a very, very, very tall order, and I think reducing demand is very important. And the guy I mentioned who did that, this, uh, this picture, he does a, a tour called um, Less is a Four-Letter Word, you know, and he's talking about the fact that we need to go back to, like, what he called 1950s levels of consumption. So where you make things and they actually are meant to last, and you make things and oh, you can repair them, rather than you know, iPhone 17 and everything else. So, so I mean, it's, it's definitely on both sides. But I do think that criminalising massive environmental damage should be done. Actually, you know. also as the seventy people here, that people kind of want to know what can we do with this? Mm. What, what, what are we? Well, I think with this, you, you can sort of look at your own behaviour, as we've all had to do, and you know, but with limited success, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, but join a local anti-fracking group; there are tons, uh, and join something like End Eco Southern Earth because you need collective action, but you also need personal reflection. And I find the difficulty with the personal side of it is that, you know, people ask you why you're doing things, and that's part of the educational side, where you try and explain it. More often than not, people don't like the answer. Um, but I think you need to do both, individual um, and collective, you know. Um, but it's, a, it's, you know, this, this is the big challenge. Uh, we need alternatives hmm? and investment in alternatives. Absolutely. And we, all, we all need to kind of take responsibility for encouraging alternative uh, Absolutely. Sources.
absolutely. And that's why extreme energy is so bad, because you know, they're using conventional resources to do more of the same but worse, whereas those conventional resources should be used to produce renewables. Yes, but also yeah. we've, we've had renewables that are, you know, questionable mm, in mm, that mm, mm, to mm. their utility, and I don't know, the, I can't think of the word, but, well, uh, how good they are, yeah. how, 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 how much they meet the need. Mm. So we, but there are so many <coughs> other things going on, there are, you know, that, 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 that need investment, that people are exploring different no, it's, it's absolutely true, and, and I think renewables are not just the panacea for everything. Um, they'd be part of a, of a picture, but not all of them. Some of them are actually worse than others, and some of the materials that they, that they need are also themselves running out. So they need a, a massive reduction in demand, which goes against Western growth capitalism. So that therein lies the massive, massive challenge. Absolutely, you know, so I think reducing, I think Mobs' notion of reducing it to 1950s levels of consumption is a, a great thing to think of, but how do you fit that into the notion of growth? You know, it's, it, you can't grow. We have one planet, and that's the simple fact, and that's where it comes up against, you know, the capitalism that we're currently living under, you know, and, and that's the massive, massive, massive challenge. Yeah. I just want to, I've got a question, but I just want to throw something in. Uh, because, I mean, I've done some field work with anti-fracking activists and also with, you know, had conversations with academics and people who support fracking mm. uh, in the industry and stuff. And what they will say, engineers uh, or any class of people, what they will say is, basically, society won't change. People are always going to want more energy. You know, the way, the, the way we pre built society isn't going to alter. And so we have to kind of just, we're just provide it because that's what they'll do. And that's mm. the basic assumption that they've got. What I find curious about that is, if you look at the, the grand scheme of human history, what's very clear is that that's actually completely idealistic. To assume that humanity don't change and we just stay doing the same thing over and over and over again for, this, for, for, for last, vast, long strengths of time, regardless of what nature does, is actually the complete opposite of the reality. Mm. So in a sense, they'll, they'll present what they're doing as pragmatism, but in reality, it's actually very idealistic. Um, and, and kind of and can be criticised on that level or that challenge. Um, I mean, one of the questions that I've got is how much in your experience of working with these sorts of movements have you seen the potential for collaboration between indigenous groups and people working in other like environments around the world, like in Britain, um, over these sorts of mm. issues? Do you think that they kind of they represent a, a, an area for kind of collaboration? I mean, we, certainly aspects of what was coming out of the potato access pipeline resistance was, mm. was precisely that. Uh, I wonder if there was much of that. Oh, it's quite considerable. I mean, in Australia in particular, indigenous peoples and farmers, we often, you know, loggerheads over the years, and now a lot of the time they're working together to resist um, you know, the onset of, uh, of unconventional energy. So that's a, a promising thing. And also now there's tons of global cooperation. There's loads of really, really good information sharing lists. They have uh, international events about how best to resist. Uh, currently, there's a, there's a film tour uh, called The Bentley Effect, which is from Australia, um, sharing with British groups how to, what they call, lock the gate, which is a big movement in Australia. So there's a lot of cooperation, a lot of sharing, a lot of people realising how serious it is. Um, because just when we need to be, you know, reducing demand and producing renewables uh, simultaneously, we're now literally running in the opposite direction as fast as possible. Because of the logic that the companies use, and by and large, of having been to team planning processes, you see straight away, they don't give two hoots about the international state of affairs or the state of affairs, they just want to make some money. And often they're very small starter firms, and what they want to do is to make it look really good, really lucrative, and then sell out to a big player. You know, but they, they have to persuade the local authorities that you know, we need this energy and that they use the argument as if it's a sort of an organic carrot. It's homegrown. <laughs> it's not homegrown. You know, they try, that's how they want to make sure that you think, oh, actually, oh, it's, it's easy. It's like food miles arguments, right? They say, oh, it's, it's, it's here. It's better than getting it from Norway, which ignores the fact that the extraction process is radically different and radically inefficient. Mm -hmm.